Hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning to you and welcome to this webinar uh, for August, uh, which is about rising heat. The title is The Heat is On, How to Live with Soaring Temperatures. This, uh, we hope, will be a very topical uh, webinar for this month, uh, given that much of the uh, Northern Hemisphere has been suffering from uh, heat waves and also wildfires uh, everywhere from Greece to Portugal to the United States to Canada. Um, I myself have been down in Spain, which has been uh, incredibly hot um, and it really brings to the surface this question of how do we live uh, with uh, growing periods uh, of heat. Um, my name is Megan Rowling. I am the editor of Zillient.org and also uh, a journalist uh, with the Thomson Reuters Foundation. There's been a lot of scientific research that's been coming out uh, over the summer about uh, extreme heat, um, obviously, I think, because uh, this is top of people's minds at the moment. Um, extreme heat has health impacts, especially for uh, poor people, elderly people, young people, those who already uh, have illnesses. Um, and this is something that policymakers and aid agencies are becoming increasingly aware of. One study that came out this summer warned that, uh, I think it was in Colombia, uh, there could be a 2000% increase in, in deaths uh, from heat waves uh, between 2031 and 2080. Um, compared with 1971 uh, to 2010 and other countries where deaths are expected to rise include Philippines and Brazil. So uh, I think the impact is, is expected to be worse close to the equator and then also uh, they predicted a smaller hike uh, in fatalities uh, in the United States uh, and European countries. So obviously this is a widespread issue. Um, and we're going to be talking about the growing risks as the planet warms and also some of the solutions. Uh, one of the obvious solutions, I suppose, to heat is for more of us to be using air conditioning. Uh, that is actually not affordable or accessible uh, to many people. Um, and also others question whether it really is a sustainable option because the more air conditioning we use, the more energy electricity we're using and how is that going to fit with uh, international ambitions to keep the rise in global temperatures in check. So we're going to be discussing these issues and more with our expert panel this afternoon who I'm going to introduce now. We have with us Muthu Kumara Mani who is the lead economist for South Asia uh, with the World Bank. He focuses on climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation and um, is going to talk to us about some recent research on South Asia out from the World Bank. Then we also have Gulrez Shah Azar, who is an assistant policy re researcher with the RAND Corporation. I think he's been doing a lot of work on, on heat in India as part, part of his doctoral research. And then we'll also be joined by Julie Arigi, who is uh, Urban and Disaster Risk Manager for the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. And Julie, I think, is joining us from Kampala in Uganda. Um, and so without more ado, we shall hear from our panelists, just to let you know that we'll be using the hashtag Rising Heat uh, for our live tweets from the webinar. And those will be coming from our uh, Twitter handle, which is at Zillion. So please feel free to retweet us or tweet yourselves. And then after we've heard from our panelists, we will have a question and answer session. We've had a lot of great questions already submitted uh, as people signed up for the webinar. So I'll draw on some of those as well. But if you would like to put live questions for the panelists into the side of the Zoom chat, please feel free to do that. I'll keep an eye on it and try and direct those to our panelists as appropriate. And if you're watching uh, on Facebook, you can put your questions into the comments section and we'll try and pick up on those too. So uh, we'll start with Manny from the World Bank. Uh, Manny, so as I mentioned, you've brought out a, a book recently um, which focuses on uh, South Asia's hotspots. 
And uh, so I think we're going to start by hearing a little bit about the key findings from that work. Sure. And over uh, to you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Megan, and uh, thanks, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, as uh, Megan mentioned, uh, we just uh, recently uh, uh, finished a, a book on uh, South Asia's hotspots. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, what our key findings were, and I'm and, and happy to discuss further. As, uh, as many of you may know, South Asia is one of the world's um, climate hotspots, be it uh, the temperature or, or, or changing monsoon uh, rainfall or, or sea level rise. It's, it's, it's all, all there. We are some of the most vulnerable countries there. So we wanted to find out uh, what the countries or the governments need to do uh, in terms of policies to make uh, them more, more resilient. And also South Asia, as many of you know, is home to some of the world's uh, most poorest uh, population. So we wanted to uh, uh, do two things. We wanted to find out uh, what specific areas, regions in South Asia will be most impacted, who will be most impacted, and what needs to be done to build resilience. The reason being uh, the policy makers are always faced with the challenge of being, having limited resources and other competing priorities. So they need to find out where exactly they need to put their money uh, in terms of building resilience. So we wanted to find out at a fairly granular level where the climate hotspots are going to be and who will be most impacted. Uh, so first we wanted to find out what's been happening the last 50 years or so. And we found out that temperatures have been increasing gradually in most of South Asia, in many parts as high as 1.5 to 3 degrees temp uh, increase in temperature, and in some parts of 1 to 1, uh, 1 to 1 uh, 1 1 1.5 degree increase in temperature. And these are substantial increases and which don't, often don't get much attention uh, uh, because a lot of times in the climate change palace, what happens is that we have these extreme events like an extreme flooding event or an extreme drought event, which gets a lot of attention from the media and also from, uh, from the government because that's quite visible. But what people fail to understand is that even a one degree increase in temperature would have huge implications for a farmer in terms of what crop he or she should plant uh, or for a construction worker in an urban city uh, it could make a huge difference in terms of health impacts or, or uh, in, in, in terms of uh, spread of certain uh, vector-borne diseases and so on and so forth. So clearly, one of the things that we wanted to highlight in the report is that from a climate change perspective, one often doesn't really pay much attention to the temperature increases that have been happening because a lot of attention goes to extreme events which, which are basically more visible. So in terms of some of the key findings, uh, the next slide. So uh, we wanted to find out in our report how temperature and changes in precipitation patterns or rainfall patterns are impacting living standards now and how they will impact living standards in the future. Uh, by living standards, we mean uh, consumption uh, patterns of, of households. So what we did was we overlaid historic climate data over historic household level data in all these countries. South Asian countries, as you know, include Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, to find out how households have reacted to previous increases uh, in temperature and change in rainfall patterns and how it has impacted, how it impacted the consumption patterns. And based on that, that information, we then projected uh, to the future in terms of using uh, climate models to project future uh, changes in temperature and rainfall patterns and how future consumption will be impacted. So as you can see in, this, uh, in these figures, one of the first things that we wanted to find out was how uh, temperature increases have been impacting uh, consumption patterns. There's now a growing uh, literature which suggests that there is an inverted U-shaped relationship between temperature and uh, income which basically means that uh, as temperatures go up, your uh, income goes up, but beyond a point, uh, your income starts to go down. 
forever. And, and we wanted to find out if there is a similar analogy we can find for consumption and, uh, and, and living standards. And we found out that indeed, for most of the South Asian countries, we found that they, they are already beyond their tipping points. In other words, any future increases in temperature will only lead to decline in consumption expenditure. And it was an interesting finding, uh, but for Nepal, which because obviously Nepal still has a much, uh, much, much colder climate than most of the other South Asian countries. So we found out that Nepal actually can benefit in, in terms of uh, uh, any temperature increase. Whereas if you look at India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, they're already beyond their tipping points as far as temperature are concerned. Then we wanted to find out how uh, climate change will impact living standards. Uh, we looked at two scenarios. One scenario where we found that uh, whether countries actually implement what the measures that they promised under the Paris Climate Agreement, which we call this climate sensitive scenario, and the other one, which we call as carbon intensive scenario, what happens if Paris climate agreement breaks down and it's business as usual. And as you can see here, in most of the South Asian countries, except for Nepal, we find that living standards are projected to go down in 2050. Uh, because if both, if Paris uh, agreement uh, goes through, or and it, in the worst case scenario, if Paris agreement breaks, up, breaks down, then obviously the impact are, are much higher in terms of almost, for example, in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, you almost will experience a 7% decline in living standards. But I think a lot of times the country specific uh, or the countrywide numbers mask some of the number of uh, things that are going on within a country. So we wanted to find out, although nationally we find that in India, let's say it's the living standards will decline by 2.8%, but actually we found out that there are uh, regions within India where the decline will be much more than more than 10%. Right? So we wanted to find out specific hotspots within uh, these countries where the impact will be the most. Next slide, please. So we uh, calculated uh, hotspots both under the climate sensitive scenario and carbon in intensive scenario, and we found out that there'll be a lot more hotspots under the uh, carbon intensive scenario. And overall, we found out that almost half of South Asia, we're talking about 800 million people, currently live in areas that are projected to become uh, climate hotspots. So uh, in terms of uh, policy implications, right? Now, obviously, uh, these countries are a lot poorer than uh, the Western counterparts. So obviously, you cannot say immediately people should move uh, to air conditioned uh, areas, uh, because obviously um, majority of the population uh, in some of these countries do, doesn't even have access to electricity or clean cooking. So clearly ask, asking them to move to air conditioning immediately will not work. But one of the key recommendations of, of the, the study was that clearly uh, development will, will be the best strategy for these countries to get them out of or building climate resilience in terms of providing more uh, educational opportunities, creating more jobs outside of agriculture, uh, improving market access, uh, creating, uh, improving the infrastructure and so on and so forth. And clearly that will get people out of their traditional, uh, let's say occupations like agriculture and so on, which are highly climate sensitive uh, to move into better occupations, which, uh, which obviously will be, uh, make them more, more resilient. Uh, of course, in the short term, uh, countries can take measure like uh, introducing more early warning systems, uh, maybe staggering uh, timing for construction workers and so on and so forth. But in the long term, we find that uh, one of the best uh, solutions for these countries will be to grow, develop, and, 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 and that will itself will uh, build a resilience uh, across, across the board uh, for, for most of the people living in these countries. I will stop here. Happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Manny. I think that was an absolutely excellent overview of some of the top level challenges facing South Asia and also interesting to see the variation uh, between countries. Um, and 
I think that sort of more granular analysis is probably going to become increasingly important. Um, and on that note, we're going to bring in Gulrez uh, from RAND uh, right now because he has done uh, some very uh, in-depth work on, on India. And it was interesting to me, Gulrez, to see on Manny's map uh, that some of the key hotspots uh, were in the interior um, of, of uh, countries, for example. Um, people tend to think of climate change impacts as being, you know, rising seas and, and flooding. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about coastal cities and, and that kind of thing. But I think, you know, what, what the World Bank's work is showing us is that there are some perhaps more hidden uh, more hidden uh, impacts and so perhaps you could fill us in a little bit on what your findings have been looking more specifically at, at different parts of India. Thanks Megan for asking me to speak about this. Um, uh, as someone who grew up in those parts of the world and in heat has a special place in my heart it's I, I've grown up in you know in hot places without air conditioning so I know how it feels to grow up in uh, in those places. Of the last eight years, I've spent four years thinking more at a country level and the first four years uh, helping develop a heat preparedness plan for a city in, in Ahmedabad. Uh, in that plan, uh, we talked about, as in other, with other heat preparedness plans, we talked about heat uh, warning, messaging, you know, what simple people, things people can do, you know, in partnership with local government officials and, and all of that. Uh, this last recent work has been on identifying places in India which are at a higher risk from, from heat waves. And the traditional conventional understanding is in terms of thinking in terms of exposure. So places which are exposed to higher, uh, higher temperatures are those are the places at risk. But there is more to it in terms of also thinking in terms of vulnerability. So there are other factors such as household characteristics, income status, access to electricity, as Mani talked about, water supply, having indoor toilets, indoor kitchens, what are the, you know, health status, vegetation, all of that impacts. And so that's what we did at RAN in partnership with the Indian Institute of Public Health, where I used to work previously, and Centers for Disease Control, we developed this heat vulnerability index. So we looked at a range of variables from published literature, which have been shown to have an impact on heat adaptation. And then we took those variables for each district of India and combined them to develop this index, which you know, which kind of risk scores places which are at higher risk for, you know, the heat hotspots, you can call them. So it's not just looking at exposure, which is temperatures, but also looking at, you know, vulnerability factors, which is the combination of all of these factors. I talked about air conditioning, water supply, electricity. And then that's the interesting finding we see that places in central parts of the country seem to be at a higher risk. So these are not those places I mean, these are hot places, but these are not the hottest of those places. And there is some logic to that because in sense that people living in places kind of become accustomed to the local temperatures as long as it's below their adaptation thre threshold. So that's what we see. The central parts of the countries are more at risk. And these are those places which traditionally have been uh, slightly lagging in terms of their what we call development, right? The, I mean, many of these places in India are, are what they the, fall under what they call empowered action group states, which are places which need more action in terms of development to have a better lifestyle. So that's... Uh, that's what we did. And, 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 and that index also gave us a lot of insights into future courses of action, you know, starting points for adaptation activities. So for example, our, our index, uh, it reduces to four uh, domains of, of demographic, of socioeconomic, environmental factors, and then health system factors. And you could also, and they very clearly, all these 17 variables reduce to these four dimensions. And that helps us start to think in terms of what we can do to improve. So in terms of, you know, demographic factors, age extremes, people at extremes of age are at more risk. In terms of household amenities, so definitely people who do not have access to water supply, electricity, you know, having an indoor toilet are at a higher risk than the people. 
And so these are the things we can do something about most immediately. So providing access to water supply in those households, access to, you know, building in those indoor toilets and, you know, having a better kind of a household, having a TV for health messaging or, or mobile devices and this stuff. And then we talk about vegetation and then we see clearly like, you know, lower vegetation uh, index or uh, less greenery makes people at a higher risk. So, I mean, what can you do? Of course, have more greenery. And right. then we talk about access to healthcare systems. So definitely, if you do not have a health facility in the neighborhood, people are at a higher uh, risk. So then, you know, strengthening those health systems are definitely going to be helpful. And so th that's why these are the starting points for adaptation act activities. Gurus, it seems to me that, you know, you really are identifying um, in more detail what uh, the point that Manny was making about how important, you know, overall development is uh, in terms of protecting people from heat. And as you've kind of cut it down into smaller chunks, which, you know, providing those services or those things would fall to different areas of government, perhaps. I'm just wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about um, if and how you've tried to work with the authorities um, to, to raise awareness about how these things can impact on people's resilience to heat and if there is any kind of joined up thinking uh, at that level, whether it's district or, or national in India, um, when it comes to preparing people or, you know, adapting to, to rising heat. So I think that uh, came from the previous work also of developing or uh, helping develop a city level heat preparedness plan. And I mean, that work ha was in partnership with the local city government. Uh, similarly, this index, a part of it was, you know, also taken in by the state governments. I think it was the government of Bihar, who also took it in their planning document to see what they can do to strengthen those networks. And it has to be done in partnership with the government, definitely and absolutely. And some of the interesting findings we also found was, I mean, conventionally, we, of course, we know in terms of exposure, urban areas are at a higher risk because of the urban heat island effect. But what we are seeing here is rural areas are also because of the increased vulnerability uh, at a higher risk. So it's not the case that, you know, moving from, as, as I think somebody asked this question in one of those questions, moving from urban areas to rural areas, could be helpful, yes, it would probably reduce the local temperature in terms of the urban heat island effect, but in rural areas, because you, there is a lack of access to those other uh, characteristics, so people would be at a higher risk. So if there is, it's tough out there. <laughs> it certainly is tough out there, and it's also exceedingly complex. And I think, as you say, it depends very much, your vulnerability is not so, I mean, obviously it's related to temperature, but that may not be, the deciding factor and I think that's coming through um, very loud and clear and even within uh, Europe I think we find this uh, so for example as I mentioned I've been in Spain for a lot of the summer and people there are pretty used to high temperatures less perhaps so to high humidity which is seems to me to be becoming more of an issue, um, so the wet bulb temperature. But um, you know, even it, perhaps people in Spain are much better able to deal with high temperatures than than in the UK, for example, uh, where you know most people don't have air conditioning in their homes because traditionally the, the temperature is not so high. But they've been having a, a major heat wave this summer, and so. Everything I, I do think is relative and lifestyles in Spain are adapted to, to high heat. So you don't go out, you know, in the afternoons when it, when it, you know, very simple ways that people, uh, you walk on the shady side of the street and there are simple ways that um, people can cope uh, with, with heat. And so I'm going to bring in Julia Rigi at this point uh, from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. Um, the Red Cross, I know, has been doing uh, increasingly... Uh, work in this area of helping people to cope with heat uh, in Europe, actually, um, as well as, as in other parts of the world. I mean, for example, uh, when those terrible wildfires hit Greece uh, earlier this summer, the, the Red Cross uh, was active. So I know you're active both in terms of helping out with humanitarian emergencies, but also, uh, you know, in raising awareness about heat waves and advising people on what to do. So I'm just wondering if you could give us an overview of um, the sort of things that, that the Red Cross uh, advises uh, when, we do, when we do get heat waves um, in different parts of the world. 
Right. Yeah. Thanks so much. And it's really nice to see so many people uh, joining this webinar and from all over the world. I've really enjoyed that part as people are saying where they're calling in from. Nice to show that wide uh, interest across the globe in this topic. And so the actions, you know, during a heat wave to prevent their impacts are actually very simple. Um, so drinking extra water, uh, trying to avoid being outside. If you do have to be outside, taking frequent breaks. Um, checking in on the most vulnerable, uh, so checking in on the elderly, checking in on people with chronic illnesses or small children. Um, interestingly, although that one is um, incredibly important because they are the sort of categories of people who are most affected by heat waves, um, the Netherlands Red Cross just recently did a study focused on the Netherlands that found that only 18%, uh, one eight, 18 percent of people check on elderly relatives during a heat wave. So it's really critical in trying to help reduce, the, reduce deaths from heat waves. And it's something that we can do a lot more of as well. Of course, it's not only about reducing the impacts during a heat wave, but also planning ahead. So um, other areas that the Red Cross engages in is collaborating with local authorities to develop heat action plans um, to be able to respond when a heat wave occurs. But even on the longer term, um, having uh, either national offices or local offices of the Red Cross engaging in conversations with city officials about the importance of um, planning ahead for heat risks. That's an area which is a bit newer, thinking about how the Red Cross sort of advocates within city planning processes, but it's also a really important area when it comes to reducing future heat risk. And what sort of work have you been doing um, in East Africa? Um, because I know that's, you know, one of your areas of, of specialization. Obviously, you know, I've read and heard um, that, you know, there's particular risks to people who are living in, in, in informal settlements um, who may not have buildings that are, you know, very well uh, able to withstand heat with, say, tin roofs and um, obviously lacking access to, to electricity in some cases or uh, restricted water supplies or have to go and queue for water. Um, I'm just wondering if, if Red Cross has done any, any specific work on that and if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So the Red Cross is trying to do a little, uh, has been trying to do some work on this and there's certainly a much bigger effort that's needed. Um, a couple of years ago, the Red Cross funded some research, which the Climate Center coordinated, um, looking at heat risks in Nairobi. So essentially looking at whether or not um, micro heat island effects exist within informal areas. And the finding of that study was very clear that they do exist and the informal areas tend to be a few degrees higher than other parts of the city. Um, it raises a lot of questions about um, what happens after that. So in the sense of, for one, does that higher temperature correlate also to higher health impacts? Um, we anticipate that it does, but that wasn't an area that was able to be studied due to um, limited data availability, unfortunately. Um, as was already mentioned, the, your impacts from a heat wave are a combination of your vulnerability and your exposure. So that study really showed that people living in informal areas are more exposed because of that micro heat island effect. And uh, the next piece is to try and quantify what is the actual health impact of that. Um, but then also taking it a step further. So if you think about an early warning system in a city, um, if we were to find with further research that people in informal settlements are also more impacted in, the, in this example of Nairobi, um, then it also brings into interesting questions about how you should structure a tailored early warning system to be able to um, try and reduce impacts across the city, but especially in those areas. Um, and then it also brings in longer term planning questions to try and reduce overall temperature through, um, you know, planting trees and other sort of green coverage to reduce temperatures. Um, I think that Nairobi study is interesting because it also illustrates um, the need for increased funding to be able to research heat wave risks in specific cities um, throughout uh, much of Africa, as well as many cities in Asia, which face a similar um, lack of funding for research to understand the sort of foundational information from which the rest of systems need to be built afterwards. So that's a really key need um, that we would identify as the Red Cross before we can even come in and take concrete action beyond just warning people that a hot season is coming. 
Um, I think one other key um, thing that I would mention as well is also considering the fact that urban growth rates are very high, especially in East Africa and other parts of Asia and Africa as well. And again, that foundational information of heat risk tied with our projections of what will happen due to climate change become really critical in ensuring that cities as they grow now are considering future heat extremes in that urban planning so it can be prevented in the future. Um, and then I guess one other key priority, which doesn't apply just to this region, but applies uh, more generally. We've recently been realizing that at a national level, or sorry, we've been undertaking a study at the moment at the national level, which is still ongoing across a number of countries to try and determine from a Red Cross perspective or a disaster management perspective, when heat waves are or are not eligible for humanitarian financing in terms of relief. Um, in some cases, they're not uh, nationally coded as a disaster. And so that limits the sort of um, relief funding that can take place or preparedness funding that can be used to um, help reduce those immediate risks. So that's another really important priority that we're looking at at the moment in addition to others. Thanks so much, Julie. That's, that's super interesting, um, especially also in terms of pointing out areas where more work is needed, a better understanding of the, the, the requirements on the humanitarian side and, you know, maybe a different way of thinking about disasters, actually, um, because we're coming up against perhaps situations in cities that we haven't um, dealt with before. I'm not saying they didn't exist, but in terms of, you know, awareness and desire among humanitarian agencies to do something about it. Um, we're getting a couple of questions coming in on the, the webinar chat, but before that, um, before we go to those, I just wanted to ask uh, Manny and Gulrez also to weigh in on where do you think uh, the key gaps are in research and what's most urgent to address? Because I think a lot of people uh, who are listening today um, would, would also like, like to hear a bit more about that. Um, perhaps we can start with Manny. Yes, uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, as, as I pointed out, I think when, when people talk of climate change, it's often about uh, sea level rise or, or extreme flooding events. And actually, we don't have much research on how uh, the temperature increases are impacting uh, economies, countries, uh, households, individuals, and so on and so forth. And, and that's also one of the things that came out of our uh, research was that indeed if you look in terms of long-term climate change uh, clearly the temperature increases are going to be playing a major role and it will impact you depending on as, as I mentioned before where you live and what you do if you're an urban construction worker obviously you'll be more impacted because you know, because you're going to be spending more time outside similarly if you're an agricultural farmer uh, increase in temperature could pretty much uh, change the way you practice your uh, cropping practices, or if you're a coastal fisherman. Uh, so clearly, I think uh, some of these things we need to, we need to understand better uh, in terms of how uh, the temperature will in, uh, impact the different sections of the society and how they need to uh, build resilience. Again, one of the things that came out of our hotspot study was that obviously the impact will be different across different countries, different cities, but we wanted to also find out what are the things that are common across these hotspots. And, 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 and the, we found out that one thing that's common uh, across these hotspots, across all these countries, six countries, was that they are generally less developed. You know, they have poorer infrastructure, uh, they are uh, water stressed. So some of these things that were common across uh, all, all these countries, all these countries. Uh, but we also found to find out what kind of households uh, are particularly vulnerable. And interestingly enough, we found out that that's, there's no common answer there. For example, we found out that in some countries, agricultural households were more, more vulnerable. In some countries, the urban households were more vulnerable. And interestingly enough, we found out that uh, women-headed households are actually more resilient uh, to climate change in, in some countries. Uh, so clearly, I think we need this type of more granular analysis in terms of uh, how uh, climate change and especially temperature will impact uh, countries and societies because a lot of times we get caught up in this big 
messages saying that South Asia is a climate hotspot or Africa is a climate hotspot. That doesn't serve any purpose if you're a policymaker. You want to, if you want to really right. find out where exactly you want to put, put your money in, in terms of policies and investments. And that I think we need more granular. Uh, right. So we need policy relevant research. Yeah. Gurez, um, if you could briefly uh, give your view on that. Sure, happy to. And I mean, building on what uh, Mani said, heat, I mean, is, is, a, I, is a very big, in a sense, inequality issue where the world seems to be divided. And I'm borrowing, borrowing a phase into the cool haves who have access to air conditioning and the hot have nots who do not. And people perceive and live with different realities on the same planet. And there's an incredibly complex interaction of various you know, effects on people, on, on, on different people. So for example, looking at the case of women and as a, as a male person, it was such a, you know, a, a, a understanding to me that how it differentially impacts women in terms of, for example, I'm thinking in terms of an Indian slum household, a woman wearing a sari, a six year long cloth with, you know, a petticoat and a blouse inside living in a household, in a, half of Mumbai's households are slum households, right? So uh, in a slum household with a, uh, with without adequate ventilation on a window there is a kitchen indoors you know which is we're probably using wood shavings or cow dung cakes to cook which is really smoky and and it and it impacts people you know and differentially women because you know they're working indoors and then you realize because half of households do not have an access to indoor water supply or bathing facilities so in that heat when people do not cannot take a shower i mean there is some recent report i've been reading i mean people, women seem to intentionally dehydrate themselves so that they do not have to go out and relieve themselves so i mean because you can only go out and relieve yourself early in the morning and late at night because there are no toilet facilities in the in the household and then i mean you assume that you know all these assumptions that women are at home but yes women are at home but they're working in economically you know productive activities they're making kites uh, incense sticks and broomsticks right and you obviously cannot use a fan in a study in Ahmedabad, we measured core body temperatures of women early in the morning six o'clock and at noon time and we noticed increases two degrees average core body temperature increases among women living in slum households and that is it just impacts people differently and we have to identify all those different pathways and as money said at at a very granular level, at a very small scale level, how it differentially impacts people. Because we, we just as well would be living an entirely different life, oblivious to how you know people who have a life other than us would be uh, going through every right. single of their lives. And, absolutely, and, yeah. And, I absolutely I mean, agree that you, you, we need a, a gender disaggregated uh, interpretation of, of how people uh, are being affected and you know if women are using negative coping strategies such as you mentioned to do with sanitation then obviously that has impacts for health and those kind of things uh, need to be better understood. I'm sorry to cut you off Gulrez, I, I just want to start bringing in some of the um, responses uh, and questions from our attendees today. Um, I'm picking up on a couple of uh, uh, inputs to the webinar chat from Gareth Morgan, who I know um, is high up in the uh, Cape Town uh, resilience uh, team um, and is working on Cape Town's first resilience strategy. Um, I'm not sure if you're leading the team now, Gareth, but um, uh, Gareth basically is saying, I feel like there's enough research to know we have to act in response. There's always a need for more research but we need, the need for more research should not stop uh, a first response. And his question is, do you have any examples of really good city heat or cooling strategies? Um, because he's thinking about pulling through the need for a heat strategy within Cape Town's uh, first uh, sort of overall resilience strategy. I think Julie had indicated to me that she, she'd like to come in on that one. Yeah, sure, thanks for that question. Uh, one of my favorite examples of um, cities work, a city rather working on a cooling strategy, a green cooling strategy in particular, is the city of Melbourne. That might be a case that you're familiar with already, but essentially the city of Melbourne undertook a tree inventory around the city and then made was essentially around tree planting um, to effectively lower the temperature of the city by a couple of degrees. And it's been documented that that was done and achieved. And I, I really like that example because it's something that um, basically any city could do. Um, 
the way they approached it was very in depth and very high tech. Um, but the basic principle of sort of having a um, urban tree planting campaign to lower the temperature of cities is, is a very um, simple strategy that any city could undertake. Um, and I would just say also, um, as the Red Cross were developing at the moment, a heat wave guide for cities that also does look at a couple of different things. One of which is what do you do when you don't have the information you need in terms of setting heat wave thresholds, those actions you can take without that foundational research. And then of course, what do you do when you have more information? So I agree with that point and really happy actually to have a colleague of yours from the city of Cape Town as part of the review team for that guide as well. So, um, but yeah, the city of Melbourne example is one of my favorite. Thanks, Julie. Um, Please indicate if, if you'd like to come in on, on that, Gulrez or, or Mani. Um, Gulrez, I know you worked directly on a city strategy, so perhaps you could draw out a couple of the best examples of some of the things that were deployed. So, I mean, that was a really starting point intervention because no other city in South Asia had done anything, uh, uh, done much on that. I think that's a big claim to make. So talking to uh, uh, just uh, annual, the daily health messaging, daily messaging of temperatures, uh, which were likely to, or if there was going to be a heat wave event going to happen, or just preparing health facilities in terms of, you know, having cooling facilities and treatments and doctors being available. I think that went a long way in reducing and the local ambulance service uh, those kind of things did help for a start we did notice that some of these interventions which were routine in the us uh, were not practical in india or had to be reshaped for example you know cooling centers walk-in cold rooms those kind of things have worked in the west but in india there i mean you could have to, you would have and we were not able to do that then was to have local you know other places you couldn't really have walking you know cold, cold cooling centers those kind of things. So yes, uh, I mean, a lot is needed and, and with suitable local, you know, modifications to what would work in those settings. Absolutely. And I think, you know, another area that people are looking at is how can we use technology more effectively uh, to, to at, a, at a very local level, at an individual level, as well as uh, at the higher city level, uh, to improve response. And another question that's come in from Alex Diaz, I think, who is based in Puerto Rico. Um, are there any new tech solutions, emphasis on the new tech, to help vulnerable communities deal with extreme heat? Uh, I don't know if any of our panelists have come across good examples of that in their work. If you have, please uh, do go ahead and, uh, and fill us in. Maybe this is an area that uh, is still uh, to be to be explored. Um, I don't know in that case whether we can <laughs> come back to you much on, on that one, Alex, but um, I imagine that also social media uh, is something that Red Cross uses, Julie, in terms of uh, spreading awareness um, about what to do. Yeah, in terms of awareness spreading, we have quite a few different approaches. Social media is definitely one of them. Um, we also, in a number of countries, have um, volunteers who would go door to door even and check on um, people who are known to be the most vulnerable. Um, in India, for example, during a heat wave last year, the India Red Cross trained volunteers to organize flash mobs around Delhi. Um, and those flash mobs gave basic information about what to do to prevent the impacts of that particular heat wave. They were done not only for the public, but also actually for um, people who worked at the Delhi airport uh, who needed to take more frequent breaks but couldn't really prevent being outside. Um, the Australian Red Cross actually has a, a telephone program where family members or um, friends can sign up about, um, sign up a person who they think should be checked on or someone can sign themselves up. And then during an extreme event, it started with heat waves, it's now with any disaster. Um, volunteers from Australia Red Cross will call and check on people and if they need additional services, then recommend them um, to appropriate medical services or et cetera. So the Red Cross takes a lot of different strategies. I guess the only other one I can think of at the moment would be um, there's a um, multi-hazard app as well in a number of countries that it doesn't only focus on heat, but extreme heat is one of the things in that app which talks about preparedness response and recovery strategies from extreme heat. 
Thanks, Julie. We're getting also some uh, ideas coming in on, on the chat. So, um, for example, Roop Singh, who I think is a colleague of yours, perhaps, uh, saying that some cities are using technology like misting stations uh, to give some people relief. Um, and Alex is wondering whether there's health technology, special masks, oxygen tanks, water products, that kind of thing. Gulrez, you mentioned uh, some maybe it's not high tech but some kind of uh, technology that's used to being tested to help workers um, for example i think maybe it was in the middle east but perhaps you can give us a bit more details on that so yes uh, i mean it's experimental but in indian national institute of occupational health they're developing this uh, cool jacket which has you know lining in the uh, in the in the lining of the jacket there are these pipes which contain water and they move it through a battery and so you can have a tank of wearable carrying small tank of cold water which circulates in the lining of the jacket. In the US I've read about phase change materials so you know solid material which converts to gaseous material and absorbs uh, heat uh, but th those solutions are there but they're few and far between I think in mind and they definitely need to be developed. If, if you ask me I think the biggest would be low no energy immediate cooling solution something like air conditioning but which doesn't use you know which is carbon neutral. So I think that would be the most immediate and uh, impactful thing. So yeah. I, I'm sure that there are entrepreneurs and uh, social enterprises out there now who are probably working on, on some of these solutions. Mani, did you want to come in on this? Uh, yes, I think uh, I would like to uh, draw parallels to uh, the, the way we have been dealing with other extreme events like extreme flooding events and so on. And we have almost perfected the early warning system, the, the escape routes and, uh, you know, uh, I think that's so been working very well because we have actually succeeded in reducing the damage from some of these uh, events in, in South Asia and, and, and elsewhere. So I was wondering if that's something we should start thinking about better early warning systems for heat events. You know, I think that will be great, especially with all the new cell phone technology and so on. I mean, I think it, it, uh, I do see sometimes I live in Washington in, during summer months, we do get some uh, uh, warnings in terms of what, and what the day is going to be like and, and so on. So I'm, I'm sure some, something like that, you know, gives warnings to people maybe to stay indoors or, you know, or, or uh, you know, uh, basically uh, do things to ensure that they are uh, fairly well protected. You know. uh, and also the last time when I went to uh, Delhi, I was in, in the peak of summer, I was surprised to see a lot of tents set up across the city, providing free water and, you know, uh, for people to cool off. So clearly, I think cities are uh, getting into some action, but it's still very low tech. But I think given that uh, technology is moving fast, I think clearly uh, we should start thinking more about these early warning systems, how to improve uh, early warning systems, especially for heat uh, stress events. And I'm, I live in Barcelona most of the time, and um, I, I receive the press releases from the city of Barcelona, and whenever there is a, a heat wave coming, they activate their heat wave emergency plan, and they mm. advise, give, they put certain messages out to the media, um, and you know the local media will presumably uh you know communicate that uh to to people um but you know i'm not quite sure and they also have social media and so they they have you know emergency numbers and and give advice and so that that is something i've i've noticed um more of that happening so you know as well as having a sort of wider longer term plan i think obviously you know when when there is a heat wave uh letting people know about it and giving simple clear advice is is sort of low tech <laughs> approach uh to these things um so uh going back to our our audience um Roop singh is saying that we need to understand whether or not interventions are really effective uh for example distributing fans might not be effective since research shows uh that they're just moving hot air around yeah i mean obviously uh there probably is a need to not only implement or try out some of these solutions but also to 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 monitor their impact Gulriz, i don't know if you've you've done any sort of monitoring uh an evaluation of some of the things that have been tried in in the cities that you've worked with 
no, not in, of the interventions, but uh, hot fans is like is slightly. Uh, it comes under discussion whether it moves hot air around or not, or if you if you can if it's helpful. But there are other technology, low technology solutions which have which are definitely proven effective, which is cool roof or rooftop gardens. So coating your roofs with white paint definitely reduces temperatures by four degrees centigrade to uh, or nine degree Fahrenheit for the US people. It definitely does. And it's a low cost, low and I mean, you can do that. Even the, my city uh, currently in Los Angeles, then it's being done there. So I mean, there definitely are solutions. The trouble with heat is as I think somebody also, Eddie uh, said previously, it's not recognized for the threat it poses. So whenever in, in my experience in, in India, I would go and talk to the government officials, look, I mean, it's going to be hot. And they would say, look, sky is blue, India is hot. What is the big deal? I mean, that is how it is. But then I have to convince them, look, it is hot and it's, it kills people. It's just that those deaths are not visible. They are they spread around. And, and to belabor the, I mean, to slightly, I think needs to, this point needs to be belabored that when we, even when we think of heat, we are thinking of extreme heat events or acute immediate heat exposure, which we call, you know, the heat wave. Chronic or low level increased exposure to heat also has extremely deleterious heat effects over the long term. Everything from reducing, you know, causing uh, micronutrient deficiencies to, uh, uh, I mean, it has a range of health effects from causing from chronic kidney disease and even cognitive harm. I mean, two weeks ago, the Harvard study came out, which shows that there is a, you know, I mean, cognitively people are not performing as well as others who are living in air conditioning or not. So all of these has effects and they haven't been studied because heat is not seen for the threat it poses. So chronic kidney disease is as common as a quarter of population of Southern South American countries it suffers from chronic disease, people who are working out in the open sun in, in fields in agricultural, that's been seen in India and in Sri Lanka and other South Asian countries. And it's big. And I mean, the only treatment is dialysis, which nobody really can afford. And like many poor people cannot afford in those settings. So, right. Uh, I, that's a very good point you make about chronic exposure and also highlighting the need to have better health metrics in order to understand uh, the effects and then to be able to deal with them. I wanted to bring money in at this stage um, because just taking it back out to the to the policy level, Eddie in the chat also made a point that when you talk to officials in sub-Saharan Africa, like you said, Gurez, they're a bit like, yeah, so it's hot and, uh, well, they don't understand the threat. I don't know, I was being slightly flippant there, but um, Mani, I was just wondering in your conversations with, with uh, policymakers and officials as you've been uh, launching the South Asia Hotspots uh, book, what, what sort of reaction have you had um, and on what level are you trying to engage policymakers? Is it something that's already recognized, would you say, or is there still some work to be done before uh, it's even possible to start coming up with uh, good responses? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good uh, question. I think uh, the initial uh, reaction was that you know, there's nothing new. We, we kind of know uh, what you're trying to say, right? Uh, but then, uh, Interestingly enough, uh, our, our, got, our book got a lot of uh, good press coverage. And, and so once it appears in the media, I think that further tweaks interest from policymakers. And something similar uh, happened uh, in India, for example, with air pollution. You know, in Delhi, uh, pollu air pollution suddenly started getting uh, headline in, in the newspapers. And that got attention and that kind of made policymakers to start taking action. Uh, so, so clearly, I think uh, the, the first reaction is, well, there's not, as, as Gulrez mentioned, there's nothing new. We kind of knew all along this, you know, these are the impacts. Our, sometimes they say, we know even better than you because we are, we are here and we know what's happening. Uh, but, but I think, uh, uh, I find that when, when, uh, when I talk about climate change, I get a lot more uh, attention at, at, at the city level, at, at, at the state level, you know, in India than at the, at the central level, because they, they are aware of uh, the, the usefulness of this type of uh, research. Like I think at, 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 I think at the central level is just, the, they are too busy with other things to, to focus on this. So. Pardon? 
Pardon, excuse me. Um, I, have, I was muted there. Yes, absolutely. And those who are on the front line of, of dealing with these impacts are the ones who, you know, obviously are going to perhaps care about it most, not sitting in air-conditioned offices in the, in the capital city. Um, Julie uh, also wanted to contribute on, on this point. Yeah, just very briefly, I wanted to mention um, and clarify that this is the point I was making on research as well. So in cities where the reaction, cities that haven't historically had a very extreme heat wave and therefore may not realize that they have a heat risk, um, it can help to have that very foundational information to be able to actually quantify um, that in the past uh, there have been heat waves that have gone unnoticed where X number of people have died, for example, and from there be able to take that information and say, but uh, at this threshold, you could have taken action to prevent those deaths and then let's form an early warning system around that. So when talking about the need for foundational research, it's specifically those two pieces of information that are not always available in cities and therefore the scale of the issue may be going unnoticed because it doesn't have the CNN effect like uh, an earthquake or a flood does, but in places where heat waves are very well understood, like the US or Europe or Australia, um, they're consistently the most deadly hazard that those countries face. So evidence is obviously uh, very important um, in, in flagging up the importance of this issue to policymakers. Um, just going back to the chat here, somebody, Lionel, makes a good point that Paris uh, has an interesting strategy of greening its schoolyards. And I think this is part of its um, resilience strategy under the 100 resilient cities work that they've been doing. I remember covering that myself and talking to the chief resilience officer about how they want to turn schoolyards from sort of concrete playgrounds into a kind of uh, oasis for the local community with more uh, vegetation and places to sit and have those open to, to local people in the quartier so that they can, you know, come and rest in the shade and um, they, they're, they're I think they must be starting to roll out uh, that strategy now, which is another good example of cities um, acting in a kind of community or local way. Um, <clears throat> I think we're getting rather close to, to having to wrap up. Um, I just wanted to bring everything together um, by just pitching in a question that we've had from Facebook uh, from Somalia, um, where uh, Abdul Qadir Mohammed Abdulhali says, um, in Somalia, we're facing so many things about environmental challenges, including climate change. And most of the community are not aware about the causes and consequences of climate change. So how can we make our society more aware on climate change to face the problem together? And it's that last point that I wanted to pick up on uh, to wrap up, which is, I think there's clearly from uh, some of the contributions and questions that we've had today and before the webinar, there's a thirst for knowledge um, about how to deal with rising heat, uh, you know, with, with climate change as a background to all of this and, and fueling the extreme temperatures and, and the, the longer term problems, the droughts uh, uh, and, and laying the conditions down for more wildfires um, and that kind of thing. So uh, in terms of spreading knowledge about what your individual organisations are doing, what other uh, agencies and organisations are doing, not, on this, I wanted to finish by asking each of you to, to flag up uh, particular ways, uh, events or networks, opportunities uh, for sharing uh, knowledge, either your own or uh, more generally between organizations, countries, policymakers, uh, whoever it might be. So perhaps we'll, we'll go in order on that and I'll uh, start with money. Uh, you could yeah, be fairly sure. brief. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think, uh, so in terms of knowledge sharing, yes, World Bank has a climate change knowledge portal. And if you go to the climate change knowledge portal, you can find out wherever you live at a very granular level, what, what how climate will impact uh, both in terms of temperature changes, uh, rainfall changes, and also extreme events. So whether, for example, you could find out whether you're living in a flood prone area or an earthquake prone area and so on and so forth. So clearly, uh, anybody can access the climate change knowledge portal to find out you know, how climate is going to impact them. But I also want to uh, pitch in one of the things that World Bank does is for every activity that we do, every project that we do has to now go through a climate screening process. 
So we need to make sure to make sure that uh, adequate mitigation and adaptation are built in uh, to the project before it, it goes on board. So that's something we take it very seriously now in terms of uh, uh, in, in mainstreaming climate in whatever we do here. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I'm thinking that there will be more um, attention put on this issue when we have the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change special report uh, on um, 1.5 degrees C of warming and uh, how important it is to try and keep to that, which is the uh, lower limit in, in the Paris Agreement. I imagine we'll see more discussion around this issue um, uh, towards the end of September and October when the report is, is due to be published. Gulrez, how about you? What are your activities? Um, where do you see opportunities to share, share knowledge on, on the heat? I mean, um... The last year's annual uh, public health association, uh, American Public Health Association, they, the theme of their last year's conference was on climate change. Uh, the National Society for Exposure Epidemiology also does a lot of work. In India, there is the National India Climate Change Research Network, ICRN, then there is this. There are there are other small, I mean, mostly associated with the researcher type net networks, uh, uh, not so much as the advocacy networks in India, unfortunately. Right. And therefore, I think it's important for people to look for opportunities to regionally, uh, nationally and regionally as well as internationally perhaps because there you're going to get more sort of specific knowledge shared which is which is perhaps relevant. I think it's very important for researchers to also communicate their findings directly with the public. So apart from writing you know research papers it's very important on people who are doing research in these topics to write op-eds, talk to people, reach out as in any mediums they can including this new you know webinar medium and you know social media stuff. <laughs> Thank you for organizing this. Thanks, Gouras. Julie, uh, I think you're, you're working in a, a network, a new new network that uh, should be helpful in this area. Yeah, so the one I wanted to really highlight for everyone is the Global Heat Health Information Network. Um, this network is co-chaired by WMO, WHO, and NOAA. Actually, one of the co-chairs is on the call today, so thank you, Hunter, for joining me as well. Um, this uh, network will be having its first meeting in Hong Kong from the 17th to the 20th of December and registration is open for those that are interested. The network is really focused on collaboration and information sharing among professionals, organizations, governments to prevent health impacts of extreme heat. So I'll put the web address for the network in the chat box and if you're interested, please register and I hope to see you in Hong Kong. Thanks very much, Julie. I think that we will be seeing more such opportunities uh, as time goes by and the world unfortunately gets hotter. Um, as for our attempts in that area, um, so at Zillion we will be uh, continuing, continuing to cover uh, rising heat um, as we do also at the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Uh, whenever there's a good opportunity to write about this we do and we also did a whole series on rising heat trying to flag it as a neglected issue in the media as well. Um, so we all can play our part uh, and in the more immediate term we will be writing up a blog with key takeaways from this discussion and that will be published on the zillient.org uh, website along with a recorded video of this discussion. So if anyone missed anything or would like to check back on something or would like to share it with colleagues please do uh, come to zillion.org uh, and, and find that article and um, or sign up to our newsletter uh, and we will include that article in our newsletter next week. So with that I would like to say thank you very much indeed to our panelists for their excellent insights uh, and I think we've stimulated a good discussion uh, highlighting what we know as well as what we don't know <laughs> and the fact that there's still a lot of work to be done in this area so uh, we shall continue to follow it and thank you to all our attendees for their contributions to the discussion and questions which were very helpful too. So thank you everybody and goodbye for now and we hope to see you on the Zillient discussion next month in September. Thank you very much everybody, goodbye. <laughs>